Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning and good evening, depending on where you are in the whole world. Now, I'm very happy to present brilliant young brains of Green Climate Fund and Seoul National University. Our journey started in August to find out the pathways for innovative transformation of the whole globe. And we had an ambition to, that we will change the world, how it behaves. Actually, what we have looked into the challenges and urgencies of the world to see what problems the whole world has and what challenges are facing us. So what we looked into is the way how we can maneuver through from these challenges and urgencies to find out the solutions and architecture of action for the whole global community. So eventually, what you would like to achieve is to find out uh, brilliant ideas, creative ideas that can create mega impact to the global community in pursuing sustainable, inclusive, and resilient societies and keeping global temperature on the 1.5 degrees Celsius of a pre-industrial level and to find out new economic paradigms and new ecosystems. Under this big framework, we studied smart city, technology convergence, and e-mobility with regional integration approach. So we will present our interim outcomes of this joint research between GCF and SNU. And I'm really, really happy to present this young, bright, handsome, and beautiful people on the stage. Online, we have Edward. So Edward, if you are ready, you can start your presentation. Please welcome Edward online. Okay. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction. My group is Amar, me, Sally, and Yura. Uh, Everyone is from SNU, but I'm also doing my internship at the GCF, and I'll be presenting for us today. So we looked into the flood and how we can respond to the flood using smart technology and regulation. So first, I would like to discuss why a flood can be serious and, and uh, acknowledge that flood is increasing in its frequency uh, due to the climate change. So throughout the 2020, South Korea, as well as many other countries, have been suffering from flood. And we expect that this, can, this trend can continue into the future and needs uh, some kind of response from the regulatory bodies. So how drone can help us respond to the flood? Well, there's different ways that we can use a drone. So for example, we can use a drone and add some kind of sensor to them, whether the slider or thermal sensor, to detect the isolated people during the flood. And if the drone also has the um, capacity to do so, we can use them to deliver the necessary medicine and the relief goods. Drones, it can also assess um, the damage that the flood has caused, or it can be used with the right technology to even predict or forecast the likelihood of the drone that can happen. So it has many applications. So despite many applications, uh, we wanted to focus on actively managing the flood using the drone as the flood is happening. Uh, so we see that here there's a pre-disaster activity and post-disaster activity, but we will not be focusing on them. So out of uh, different types of drones, we were interested in drones with beyond visual line of sight, BVLOS for short. What it is, is that it's essentially a drone that can operate even if we cannot see them physically or uh, in distance. 
good thing about the BVLOS is that it is already available. The technology is already there for us to use. And it has many advantages. Um, so one of them is cost effective to be used in dangerous situation instead of placing human in such situation. This has a big potential to deliver search and rescue or, or inspect the damage cost. And unfortunately, there's some limitations to using the BVLOS. That is the regulation, uh, most regulations that we've looked at usually doesn't allow the BVLOS to be used. So this is an area that if it can change uh, to, to suit the purpose of the flood rescue, then it, then it can be worthwhile to change the regulations. So this diagram is just to illustrate the BVLOS. As you can see on the left side, that's the most drones that we may be familiar with, at least uh, commercially. In the middle, we have uh, extended visual line of sight. So that is kind of between the visual line of sight and the BVLOS. And BVLOS, as you can see, can operate without us having to observe how it is used. So yes, the, the drone regulations that we've looked at in general, hmm. the drone pilots must maintain a visual line of sight with the drone at all times. So this means that Although the drone can have technology to help the flood relief, uh, the regulation is in a way preventing it. And we acknowledge that the regulation is not random. It is there for a reason, but because technology, it progress so rapidly that sometimes regulations may not be up to the pace with the benefit of the technology. So we have looked at two regions of interest. So one is Cambodia. Cambodia is a region that has uh, immense flood risk. So hundred thousands of people across Cambodia suffer from drone. Some even die from the drone. There's many uh, house damage as well. And the rice field and the agriculture sector has also been negatively affected. These are some of the drone regulations that we found in Cambodia. So you can't fly drone around airport, that makes sense. You have to fly drone within a certain height limit. You can't fly during a certain time of the day. It has speed limit. You can't fly over the people or around the historical temples. Next country we looked at is Laos. Like Cambodia, it also has a big damage from the flood risk. So 100,000 people again suffer from the flood in Laos. And um, yeah, many of, the, many of the fatalities, they happen. And the important uh, buildings and sites, they also get damaged as well. Laos also has some drone regulations already. So it has a weight limitation. It can only be flown in good weather condition because some of the drones, they cannot endure harsh weather conditions. It can't fly over people like Cambodia. It, it cannot fly around the airport like Cambodia. And you have to um, respect the privacy. So there's some private issue as well. So we picked those two regions because those two regions, while they suffer from flood, their regulation, although it is already in place, it is much weaker than most of the other countries' regulations that we've looked at so far. So this means that these two countries can be a good site to investigate the potential benefit of using BVLOS to detect and save people and even potentially deliver. Mm. So yeah, these two countries, it's a good test site to investigate and verify the effect. And given if there can be positive results, given that, then we know that the potential can be applied to other countries as well. And that the regulations in other countries for BVLOS in flood relief is worth changing. So that is well prepared. Thank you very much for your time.
As the next presenter, I would like to give you Sam John. Yes, yeah, thank you for Professor Song. Uh, my name is Sam from Vietnam. So represent for my team. The topic is about Vietnam. Is this time for a smart solution? Like focus on policy of electric vehicles. Our team members, Drazen, Joshua, Heiner, Jisoo, and Dai. So I would like to give you the outline of the presentation. I'm going to give like very brief overview about Vietnam and then the current context in Vietnam about electric vehicles in the context of international and about how the proposal for building the electric vehicle policy in Vietnam. So this is very brief information. The capital is Hanoi, it's a very beautiful country, and the population, we're reaching around 100 million person, and the total area, we have very long line coach, and the GDP for this year reaching 2,700 US dollar per year per person. And this is the, uh, about the overview of Vietnam. Uh, uh, this is the uh, new established enterprises was registered in 2020. So if you can see in the uh, graph here, the transportation newly established enterprises reaching like 3,600 um, companies, startup like newly established. So it's like a huge potential market for uh, the transportation. So um, this is a slide I borrow from Dr. Kim dong -war. He would like to emphasize this, like the miracle of Han River of Korea. Like in very short time, uh, Korea was visible in the science, technology, innovation uh, maps. So Vietnam now try to step like step of Korea, and we're hoping to be appear to be visible in this map very soon in the future. So, and to like get over the middle income traps. So I would like to show about uh, this map. And this is the, um, as the international context of the electric vehicles. So it's like developed in very rapidly and you can see it's like reaching 2.1 million globally in 2019 and increasing about 40%. And this is the current contact transportation vehicle in Vietnam. So um, now currently like calculation is around 45 million motorbikes and 2.1 million cars. So it's very huge, like everyone have like personal uh, vehicles. And the normal, we, our public transportation is not developed yet. Only the bus, the metro system not yet operating or the BRT with very limited routines. Even the train system, the whole nation, we have only nine lights, very low workload. So, um, with the complexity and the population, also the demands of using transportation, Vietnam is very huge market for um, develop the new um, vehicle like electric vehicles. And this is the, like, I would like to show a little bit about the comparison, global comparisons about the revenue um, uh, have because of the motorcycle. So in, in the area, Vietnam was ranked the third, like around 10 million, 400 million US dollar, like less than, because we, our population is very less than China and India. However, the complexity of using motorcycle is very high. And as you see, like, this is very regular on the street in Vietnam a lot of like motorbike, motorcycles. So also is the reason causing of like air pollution a lot and always in heavy traffic any time of the day. So yes, that's what we like a regular daily. So I also have to work in this crowded. And uh, I would like to show about the um, 
possibility and also the potential. Now in Ministry of Science and Technology, under VKIS, we initiate two big projects about PMSM motor. With KIST, and at the end of 2021, we will have prototype uh, for the first electric motor with KIST Korea. So uh, this is very clear roadmap, but we, we are now initiating the project and very potential for electric vehicle developing. So uh, because of the um, like desire to uh, replace on the traditional vehicle by electric vehicles, however, we don't have any policy or legal corridor for develop or uh, encourage the in electric vehicles. So um, even this um, was in the lead of supporting industry products priority for the development of Vietnam. So it's had a lot of advantages on so the Ministry of Transportation really care about the developing of EVs. So uh, we, our team like proposed a, like a little basic specific uh, about the electric vehicle, like more advantages on tax or discount the uh, using electric vehicle big cars so also the insurance company could get like discount or more advantages to the person who change from traditional vehicle into electric vehicles. So um, this is the very six steps basic to propose the roadmap for electric vehicle policy on so how to propose to government to develop it. So because in Vietnam, the DB is very weak. So we go, now we are doing the DB survey to making and also to show the potential to the government. How many people willing to change to EVs? So based on that analysis, we will make recommendation and try to make the trial implementation in specific area like Hanoi, Da Nang or Ho Chi Minh City. And then uh, based on the using and the apply, we can have the feedback and ad adjustment. After the six steps, we could initiate like step by step to make it like into implementation. So for the future solution and the future direction, so to solve the traffic problem, like the public transportation could be more developed and to be reduce the GSG, so we also have to uh, change to electric vehicle. So it's kind of like develop the policy for the EVs is the potential for developing. And uh, Viet Vietnam want to show their willingness and the desire to make it in the short, f in the next coming future. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I would like to introduce Miss Maria Jose. She will introduce us Mark Farm. Good afternoon, everyone. We are very grateful to be part of this partnership between GCF and SNU. And we're especially thankful to Professor Yoon Hien Yong, who has guided us along the way during these months working on this research. Um, I want to introduce my team members from the SNU side, Siri Wan, Subeida, Yodit, Wahiba, Hachalu, and Teu. And from GCS side is my colleague Yannick and myself, Maria Jose. So we first are gonna start with a contextualization of uh, why we chose this topic. We're gonna introduce some case studies from research, some applicable technologies and sectors to this theme, and then what the next steps could be for the future partnership with the GCF and SNU. So as we all know, um, annual CO2 emissions have been increasing since the 1750s, but despite the intervention of multilateral institutions and national policies, they have still been increasing. So we thought it would be a good way to tackle this problem. And if we can see on the graph on the right side, um, we can see a breakdown of where the emissions come from. So we see 73% energy, 18% agriculture, and then we have waste management and industry as well. 
But we have to underscore the fact that emissions in developing countries mostly come from the agricultural sector, and this is the sector we want to target the most. Um, and we also know that the majority of carbon emissions come from CO2, um, but we also have methane and nitrous oxide, and we want to emphasize the fact that these two gases come are the main uh, emissions from agricultural practices. As more specifically, over a 100 time scale, one ton of methane contributes 28 times the amount of carbon dioxide to the warming potential of the planet, and nitrous oxide contributes 265 times. So we thought it was important to tackle these two gases um, through addressing agricultural practices. So where does Africa fit in the global context? And that's what we are trying to explore here as well. It's the world's second largest continent. It has the world's second biggest population but it's also one of the fewest uh, emitting continents of the world compared to where we are now in Asia Pacific, which 17.3 billion metric tons compared to 1.3 billion. But actually, if we distill the information further, the emissions from Africa have been decreasing since 2009 steadily. So we thought it was important to not only target mitigation, but adaptation measures, because this is the sector of the planet that will be most impacted um, in terms of negative effects of, of climate change and it will rising temperatures will contribute to an increase in droughts in flash floods and also deteriorate food production water availability natural ecosystems and biodiversity um, and we thought it was really important specifically to target east africa so this is when we start focusing on our research proposal and if you can see on the map on the center the most emitting uh, region of Africa is East Africa with 5.9% of em emissions, specifically agricultural emissions. And if you see on the left, we focused on the countries Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania because they are top three greenhouse gas emitters in energy, specifically in the agricultural sector. But I have good news as well because there's already a national ambition to tackle these ambitions. So if you see the three countries have declared um, that they want to reduce 20 to 60 percent the carbon emissions by 2030 and they also have um, a regional framework as you can see and they within their national action plans they have established intended nationally determined contributions and also the regional policy framework will help us to tackle the negative impacts of climate change through partner states different stakeholders to implement initiatives that will address climate change and also address sustainable uh, development, which is why we wanted to introduce smart farming as an idea to tackle these problems, because it'll tackle fourfold through the SDGs and Agenda 2030, but also through a green resilient recovery, specifically in the context of COVID-19. It will tackle food security and gender inequality. And we thought it would be through two channels. One of them is digitalization, so value added through a more accurate diagnosis of farms in terms of operations and management, allowing for better decision making. So if you can see, you digitalize farm processes and it'll tackle the operations and management. It will improve hardware and software of the farm, and it'll also contribute to the sustainability and resilience of overall farm processes. Um, but also the second channel we want to target is energy efficiency, specifically because farming activities are very energy intensive. And in the context of East African farming structure, the sector is mostly composed of smallholder farmers and which are oftentimes marginalized um, from the urban centers. So the, the energy sources are hard to get and is mostly composed of burning fossil fuels. So we thought it would be threefold the way we we'll tackle this through renewable energy sources and solar, we got an electricity and heating specifically through technologies like solar heat collectors, water heaters and electric panels. And this will also target like drying crops, irrigation and lighting homes and farmhouses. Then we have wind energy and it'll cut costs on energy consumption and agriculture. And specifically because wind turbines mix up the air and it directs carbon dioxide more towards the crops, which produces um, better crops. And then we have biofuel specifically to eliminate the practice of burning fossil fuels. And this will also target health indicators um, in, within these farming communities. What are the challenges? And we identified several. Of course, there's first the digital divide, which is the difference between 
distance between the technology itself and the user. So we have to make sure that the technology will be used actually by these smallholder farmers um, to maximize its potential. Then, of course, we have the telecommunications and networks infrastructure. There needs to be a certain level of infrastructure for us to implement the smart farming. And also, we have to address the high maintenance of these technologies. Who will continue to pay for the maintenance of these technologies? And lastly, and most importantly, we think digital inclusiveness. Because also, access to new technologies in developing countries always brings um, an equal distribution of balance. So who will control this technology? Who will control the data? And who will protect the interests of smallholder farmers. Also, the challenges have to do with governance, institutional, and financial constraints, and we want to really emphasize the context of the COVID-19. There's fierce competition for international finance, so that's one of the main challenges we want to underscore. Of course, also the rule of law and accountability, so proper policies and legislation have to be implemented so then to ensure the proper handling of this data. Who will to control this data of the smallholder farmers, and also that it won't exacerbate inequalities within these communities, and overall good governance, specifically tackle corruption, potential corruption, and also protect the interests of smallholder farmers from the climate shocks, but also from agribusiness companies. And now I will turn over to my colleague Hachalu for the case studies and technology analysis. Thank you very much. Um, I will proceed from the second uh, case study. Actually, our team uh, undergone through different case studies, but for the sake of this presentation, uh, we will present only the best practices that we have found for the target areas. The first case study is the life agri-climate change, which was implemented in 28 European countries as a pilot. It was conducted in 2010 to 2013 in France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. It was initiated because the agricultural sector contributed 10.1% of the total greenhouse gas emission per year, and the soil contains large amount of nitrous oxide as a result of the improper usage of fertilizers and methane due, due to the, due to the mal pro, uh, inappropriate storage of manure. To elevate this project, as an obje the, the project took an, ob an objective of transforming the local farming practices to efficient farming practice that can tackle greenhouse gas emission and reduce energy consumption. And this process has two, three different phases. On the first phase, the community was trained for implementation of the mitigation measures. The community was trained so that they will use appropriate amount of fertilizers and advised to plant leguminous plants on arable land to fix nitrogen in the soil. They were also trained to, appropriate, uh, to appropriately utilize the storage of manure so that they will have the appropriate way of uh, mitigation mechanism. The second phase includes the software development along with the, tar the partners that will collect the data from the farmland, from the farmers, and that collected data will be analyzed and interpreted for appropriate measures to be taken in the farmland. As a third year, after three years, the project revealed that the reduction of greenhouse gas emission by 22.2%. The second case study we reviewed is the case study in climate smart agriculture for smallholder farmers in Kenya and in Tanzania. On this case study, 2,500 farmers from Tanzania and Kenya were participated. Out of this, 46% of them are women. And more than 33,000 trees were planted around the region by 44 uh, tree nursery sites construction. And out of this, 235 terraces were built for the conservation of soil and water, and two big Biogas plants were constructed so that the energy efficient cooking stoves would be distributed for the community. In turn, the community will use that uh, energy efficient stoves for 
deforest decreasing the deforestation, in turn, that will have a positive impact on the climate change. Having this, we, as a team, try to see the applicable technology that could possibly exist in order to elevate this problem in the target region. The first target, uh, the possible technology we have looked is the precision farming. And precision farming is a decision-making system by using of the information technology. It is a management system to increase productivity and economic return with minimal, uh, minimal environmental impact. So, the first pro uh, possible technology that we propose for this case is farmers may only you need to use, use the smartphone individually, whereas they might have also possibly have some devices like drones and portable sensors in a clustered manner. There are different platforms out there to, pro to provide uh, data analytics like one soil. The, this data analytics could be freely do provided for the smallholder farmers, like with the pay as a service business model, the smart, the, the smart tractors could also be implemented for the uh, farmers but, uh, as a best way of mechanism to use on the field. Let's see this video and have a good insight for what a smart precision farming is all about. With precision agriculture, farmers need to know precisely what inputs are needed where, in what amount, and when. This requires collecting a lot of information from different sources and in different parts of the field on things like soil nutrients, the presence of pests and weeds, the level of greenness of the plants, inputs applied, and the weather forecast. Once collected, this information needs to be analyzed to produce agronomic recommendations. For instance, given the developmental stage of a plant, its level of greenness may reveal its nutritional needs. This information, combined with the characteristics of the soil where the plant is located and a forecast of the weather, can be used to determine how much of a certain fertilizer should be applied to that plant the next day. Delivering agronomic recommendations on time to farmers and ensuring they are able to apply these recommendations is key. Farmers need to have all the necessary inputs at hand and be able to translate the recommendations into actions in the field. To solve this problem, big farmers use sophisticated machinery that collects geo-referenced information on soil characteristics yields, and greenness of the plants. These machines are often connected to the internet and send the information automatically to ag big data firms that analyze the information and send agronomic instructions back to the machines, which are able to automatically apply them in the field. For instance, using robotic devices attached to GPS-guided tractors. However, solutions like these may be economically infeasible for medium and small-scale farmers. These farmers lack the scale to afford that sophisticated machinery, lack the knowledge to operate the non-automatic aspects of the machines, and lack the resources to hire a person who knows how to do it. Sometimes, many of the necessary complements are not readily available, or there is no connection to the internet, or there are not sufficient skilled workers. However, a number of solutions are being developed to many of the problems that medium and small-scale farmers face when trying to implement precision agriculture technologies. Easy to operate economic sensors to measure soil humidity, salinity, and nutrient content. Portable networks to transmit the data collected by field sensors to a central location, as well as economic ways to connect to the internet. Remote sensing through the use of satellite imagery to assess the health status of plants in an economic way, and without requiring that producers know how to operate a device or interpret complex data. The new sharing economy is creating opportunities for farmers to just pay for the services they need, whenever they need them, very similar to the way that Uber operates. And there are many firms competing to provide other services such as drones, data analytics, and forecasting. All of these technological developments are pieces of a puzzle that needs to be put together to make precision agriculture a real option for medium and small-scale producers. And 
Having this, having said this, and the next possible uh, agricultural practice or smart farming practice that could be possibly implemented is the greenhouse farming. In this region, applying this greenhouse farming will uh, implement with the, with the implementation of IoT, big data analytics, and AI will in, will flourish on the area. Beside to that, the greenhouse. Uh, beside to that, the greenhouse. Beside the greenhouse, we also have possibly implemented the construction of uh, big biogas plants in the target region that will help the community to mitigate the, the climate as well as to manage the household energy consumption, reduce the deforestation, and that in turn will remarkably contribute on the reduction of greenhouse gas. The next phase, what was going to be happen is the collaboration, in collaboration with GCF and SNU, we are currently now identified the uh, framework and initial research has been conducted and the report has been developed in order that report could be aligned with the idea of GCF vision and that will be creating the tangible project or program that will formulate a strong climate rationale. And the next step will be to study in detail the impact potential for both co-beneficiaries and the beneficiaries by answering two basic research questions. For instance, we will try to answer what is the project lifetime emission reduction in tons of the carbon dioxide equivalent and what is the number of direct and indirect beneficiaries on the reduction of food and water security. So the strong collaboration between SNU and GCF will try to answer those questions in the coming times. And these are the reference materials we have uh, looked through and gone through. And thank you very much. And I will call upon my friend uh, Ethan for the next presentation in EVEC. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Okay, uh, this is the slides. All right, thanks everyone for your time today. Um, I'll just briefly introduce my team. It's myself, Jorge, Yannick, Sergio. Uh, not here with us today is Sanghan, and it, we were all guided kindly by Professor Song. So, what we wanted to do was initially look at e mobility with the regional integration, but what we found out was that e-mobility is incredibly complicated. We almost didn't know where to start. So our first step was to sort of operationalize e-mobility. And what we looked at is a bunch of different concepts and we tried to break down what is e-mobility. And if you look at these pictures, maybe some of these are what e-mobility is to you. Um, and in reality, what we decided was that e-mobility is four things. So a brief overview, we're gonna talk about the technology, the infrastructure, policies, and the business models behind e-mobility, and then we'll briefly touch upon some legacy issues with e-mobility. So I will start with technology, and what I think the most important aspect of e-mobility is, and the most important technology is, is batteries. And as I've put there at the bottom, they're literally powering uh, the movement to decarbonize energy and transport. Um, but, but batteries have a lot of negative externalities that really need to be mitigated in order for us to successfully transition to a clean energy future and transportation future. So what I'm going to speak about today is first I'll just give a bit of a background on batteries. Um, I'll talk about some trends in the battery market. I'll talk about the negative impacts and finally uh, reuse and recycling of batteries which is key to mitigating those negative impacts. So. The batteries we're going to be speaking of are lithium-ion batteries. These are the same batteries that are in your smartphone, um, and those are the batteries that are in uh, electric cars and scooters and whatnot. Uh, the ion and lithium-ion batteries could be many, many different materials. Uh, it could be cobalt or nickel. Uh, lithium-ion is just an umbrella term for a specific type of battery chemistry. Now, Lithium is found in abundance in South America, in uh, the Atacama Desert and in the Andes, as well as in China. And as many as 20 different materials can go into creating one single battery. And it's a complex global supply chain that goes into that. 
lithium is extracted via leaching, which is essentially pumping uh, a, a solution into the ground, which uh, reacts with the lithium and then it is pumped out and dried. Um, this is quite water intensive, which we'll talk about later. Um, and other metals are mined, which again has its own uh, environmental implications. And now, if anyone has bought Tesla stock in the last 10 years, you'll know that uh, EV sales are increasing almost exponentially. And that is a factor that plays into the importance of mitigating the negative uh, environmental impacts around batteries. So basic, some basic trends. Uh, really, really simply, in the last 10 years, batteries got cheaper and denser. And in the next 10 years, that's gonna happen as well and lithium ion batteries are gonna stay dominant also for the next 10 years. Why is that important? Well, it's important because as batteries get cheaper and denser, it means that cars can have a bit better range at a lower price, which means that batteries will become more accessible to, the, to more people. Because right now, I'm not sure if you've looked at how much, for example, a Tesla costs, but it's more expensive. And um, you know, comparing a, a Nissan Leaf, for example, with a Honda Civic, the Nissan Leaf is going to be more expensive because it's electric. Um, and what's crucial about that is as the vehicles get cheaper, the demand for lithium is going to grow. And by 2030, the demand for lithium is expected to increase fivefold. Um, right now, electric vehicles, vehicles account for 24% of all, all lithium sold. In 10 years, that's going to be 80%. Um, and that's, this plays into what we're going to be speaking of in a bit. Uh, so these are some battery technologies. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about these today. Um, but really what I'm going to talk about here is the negative effect. So the first one is greenhouse gas emissions. And what people don't realize is that batteries actually have a large a amount of embedded carbon. And it's a wide range, but studies show that batteries account for 10 to 80% of an EV's life cycle emissions. And this is best exemplified by this graph here. So if you look at the second column to the left, it will show the most efficient um, internal combustion engine vehicle. And then if we compare that with the fourth column from the left, that's the average European plug-in hybrid. And what you can see is that the purple uh, part of the, the, the column is the manufacturing emissions. And for an electric vehicle, it's larger. But what makes it even worse is that uh, the battery, which is the little green, uh, the green portion of the bar, adds to that. So no matter what, when you buy a car, more carbon has been emitted from an electric vehicle than uh, tip a typical internal combustion engine vehicle. When it gets worse, though, is when you pair that with a dirty energy grid. So if you look at these two, um, the, 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 the graph for Germany, the bar for Germany, you can see that there's actually no difference. Even though you're going to buy an electric or a plug-in hybrid and you're going to want to save uh, carbon emissions, you're not, you're not going to do it in Germany because their energy grid has a lot of coal. Um, so clearly, tapping into the battery supply chain and reducing the emissions is going to be key because people are going to be trying to save the planet by buying, ba by buying electric cars, but in reality, you're not going to be making as big of an impact as you're hoping, in part because of how much CO2 batteries emit, and it's very geographic dependent. Uh, for example, um, American manufacturers' batteries, on average, emit 65% less emissions than their Chinese counterparts. There's other negative impacts as well. So first of all, it's water usage. Um, 1.5 million liters are needed per ton to, per ton of lithium. Um, and this is in water-scarce regions, such as the Atacama Desert in Chile. So that's going to have adverse effects on livelihoods. Uh, additionally, there's the, fa the fact that you're pumping a saline solution into the ground. And, and uh, as you may know, having a lot of salt in your water source is, is very, very toxic. So you end up with, with crops or animals or in, in humans being impacted by that. And then finally, I mentioned that cobalt is one of the main ingredients in a battery. And 60% of the world's cobalt was found in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there has been uh, an increase in mining associated violence and child labor with the mineral. And unfortunately, there has been a correlation between that increase and the increase in demand for lithium ion batteries. So reusing and recycling batteries will reduce the demand for extractive minerals and will alleviate some of these negative externalities. And this is going to be crucial because batteries are going to keep growing and the market is going to keep growing. So 
Reuse is not necessarily as important as recycling, but we'll still talk about it because it's quite interesting because essentially what is probably an unknown fact is that batteries are retired from service from electric vehicles when they have 80% of their capacity, meaning 80% of a large battery is, is still quite substantial and there is the potential for these batteries to be reused um, to complement intermittent renewables such as solar and wind and then you, you're uh, you know, alleviating the need for other batteries to be uh, ex minerals to be extracted and produced. The issue is that there's a lot of barriers to adoption for this basically right now because refurbishment costs are high and, and new batteries are still quite low. So in 10 years when there's far greater batteries on the market that are secondhand, well potentially this might be a viable option to reduce the load of minerals needed for batteries. But what's more important is recycling because recycling can actually reduce the energy demand in material production by 40 to 50 percent and that's because when a battery is, is spent it does not mean that the minerals are useless in fact the minerals can be repurposed and used again in the battery which means that you don't actually need to um, you don't need to mine those minerals um, the issue as with many things is that the actual process for recycling batteries right now that is most economical emits more greenhouse gases than it saves but that doesn't mean that uh, more carbon friendly processes don't exist, they do, they just aren't funded. So, uh, in summary, e-mobility will not be truly environmentally friendly without significant advancements in battery reuse and recycling, meaning that we need to pair all this growth in battery technology with growth in recycling technology, otherwise we might have a concurrent crisis on our hands in terms of environmental and sustainability and excess carbon emissions from battery productions. And the key point to remember here is electric vehicles represent less than 1% of all vehicles on the road today. So that means you can probably still buy Tesla stock and you can also probably focus on investing in these recycling technologies because there is a lot of room for this to grow and there's a lot of potential for this to go awry. So that's it for my section. Um, now Jorge is gonna present on the infrastructure and thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, Ethan, for your presentation. So, it is true, I am agree with you. We need batteries for e-mobility, but also we need something for charging them. We need electricity, we need infrastructure. So, I wish launch some numbers. For example, the most sold product for e-mobility is the four seats electric cars. Uh, that kind of vehicles, um, the average consume is 0 0.20 kilowatts hour per each kilometer. That represents 282 kilowatts hour each month. Also, it's expected that by 2040, we will reach 50, 54 million of electric vehicles. So, that numbers, uh, let's think us that we need something, we need an ecosystem that supports the e-mobility. Uh, for that, uh, also we need the, the enough infrastructure that supports that. So I found that uh, we have two main streams for uh, infrastructure that supports the electric mobility. We need uh, the energy generation and also we need the uh, distribution uh, devices. So. Talking about the energy generation, uh, although renewable energy is the most suitable for e-mobility and for mitigating the global warming, uh, it is not the most energy efficient. For example, it is estimated that by the 2050, the photovoltaic energy reach uh, just the 50% of efficiency. So it is not enough for support the big number of units that we will have. Uh, also, uh, we have to consider that the collateral, collateral damage that uh, the wind uh, production, the wind, wind energy production, or the hydroelectric energy produced exceeds the benefits of getting clean energy. Uh, in the same way, uh, in developing countries, the price of energy is 
relatively high compared with the price of fossil fuels. It is due to the uh, subsidies applied on fossil fuels. Uh, this behavior slowed down the, the adoption of electric mobility. So, e-mobility development requires a balanced and dynamic mix of renewable energies since photovoltaic uh, energy, wind or hydroelectric energy is not enough, we have to include another kind of clean energy that well managed could be the solution in order to achieve the agreements that are launched in the Paris Agreement. So, I am not in favor, I am not against the use of nuclear energy, but because of the time restrictions for achieve the Paris Agreement, we have to start to think in that kind of solution as an immediate solution. I remember yesterday a speech said that we are, no, no we are. Remember you, the, the photo of Thanos, that he's looking for energy. Also the speaker said, we, we are looking for a new kind of energy source that could be able to support all the future energy requirements. So that's why I mentioned maybe nuclear energy could be a kind of solution. I'm not, I am not sure. But uh, nowadays, a new kind of generators or reactors are being developed, a kind of green reactors that are able to store energy when the demand is low or produce the enough energy for supporting the energy requirements. So, in the other hand, maybe the most influent factor in the availability of charging stations. Um, nowadays, most of e-vehicles uh, owners charge the, their cars at home or at, the, at the, their work, workplaces. Uh, so, for people that does, does not have access to charging infrastructure, public charging facilities are the unique option. Uh, the demand for public charging infrastructure has increased in 60% between 2013 and 2018, reaching 600,000 uh, units uh, around the world. So the availability of charging stations heavily influences the buying behaviors. A study shows that the biggest number of charging stations are located in China, uh, North America, uh, the, uh, Europe, the remaining of Asia, and the last number are located in Africa and South America, except Brazil. Brazil has enough number of charging stations. So, charging stations cost is other factor that influences their adoption. A high cost of its infrastructure stops the development of e-mobility. Uh, for example, in South America and Africa, the charging stations infrastructure uh, is 100% imported, creating a barrier for e-mobility adoption. So, the success of e-mobility projects also is conditioned by the continuity of the service that infrastructure provides uh, in terms of distance between charging, charging stations. For that, it is needed to distribute uh, homogeneously the charging stations for providing enough charging services. So, to conclude, uh, the opportunities for e-mobility infrastructure comes from the government support that is developing policies and regulations for encouraging the adoption of e-mobility uh, supportive infrastructure, for lowering infrastructure prices, and for creating local and regional e-mobility projects. Next, my colleague Yannick will continue our presentation. Thank you. Also from my side, a warm welcome to all present here and those following our live stream on YouTube. As part of the GCFSNU Joint Research Program 2020, I am looking forward to talk about the key role policies play in making the transportation sector more sustainable. 
First, I will talk about why the right policy framework matters. Then I will present some areas where policymaker could address to make the sustainable, um, to make the, the switch to a sustainable transportation sector. And in the end, I will draw my conclusion. Let me first start with a comment that was made, was made in the new climate economy report from 2018. There the authors write, while many private sector players are stepping up, policymakers in most countries still have the handbrake on. I think this is something, the indication of this statement we can see on this chart uh, on my slide. It shows the EV sales um, globally and we can see that 50% of them are being sold in mainland China. And what is the reason for that? Well, during the last year, as we know, China really pushed EVs. They created the right policy framework. So this gives us the reason that uh, policies are really crucial, the role they play in this transformation. Let me first start with the production side and then go to the consu consumption side. It is really important that policymakers, when creating their policies, they create business certainty because car companies, when they enter this business, they need certainty, they need stability, so policies and their implications should be known, if possible, several years in advance, so policymakers can plan accordingly. Then in the beginning, a production quota could be addressed to make the switch to EVs. Um, that means that a certain percentage of cars produced by car manufacturers will be um, EVs. This is, of course, a policy that on a later stage will be phased out. And, of course, there are also a lot of financial incentives policy maker can create. Um, I think I will address there two of them. Um, first, for example, policymaker can re address the research and development costs um, to give the push to EV production and then of course also through tax reduction for EV companies. So then we have like cheaper production of uh, EVs or they made that uh, possible. I think it's really crucial to look at the consumer side because um, in the end the consumer decides which car he will um, buy when he wants uh, to, to have a new car. So many countries, for example also Korea and some European countries, they um, provide grants for individuals that uh, are willing to buy uh, an EV, so they create the right incentive there and then of course also again through tax reduction um, that are levied on, on, on uh, combustion engine powered cars um, could be lifted for EVs that's successfully done for example in Norway and studies shows that it really pushes um, the sales of EV. And then of course it should be uh, fun to have or own an EV right so I think also their policy maker could address with smart policies uh, the user experience. For example, during rush hour, um, EVs could be allowed to use the bus line, so they go faster from point A to point B. Um, but policy maker, of course, need to be careful about this because, um, uh, yeah, this is probably a policy that needs to be phased out when a certain uh, amount of EVs are on our roads. And then last but not least, the infrastructure is uh, really uh, important. Um, as we know, EVs need to be uh, recharged. So I think policy maker there could go through the building code, for example, in a city and make it a mandate that um, buildings from a certain, uh, yeah, that buildings that are being built in the future need to have um, on their parking lots the, the right infrastructure. I think here of a yeah, charging station in front of grocery stores or in front of cinemas so that um, people can plug in their EVs. 
And my conclusion from this uh, is that a holistic approach is needed. Different policies uh, I presented um, can create the right policy framework and make this switch to a sustainable uh, transportation sector possible. And then, of course, the local uh, context also needs to uh, be taken into uh, consideration. Some policies work better for developed countries, others better for developing countries. Thank you so much, and please welcome the next presentation, which will be Sergio Borcha with the topic e-mobility and business models. Good afternoon, everyone. So I will talk about the business models in EVs. Uh, as we have seen during this GSDB conference these days, we had a session from Latin American countries talking about the perspective of EVs. So um, We have, to, we have to see about the challenges that we are facing, yeah? And how can we solve it? So through this uh, GSDB conference, we, we've seen that most of the presenters uh, focus on the incentives for new technologies. Of course, we have to create an incentive in order to motivate people to switch to EVs. But also we have to break some cultural paradigms yeah, that during the last century is on the mindset of the consumers. And through that, we have to build the new business models. So basically, in, in this uh, presentation, I will talk about the charging infrastructure uh, business model. But these are the five moments of truth that uh, the industry suggest to make uh, profitable models for EVs. So in charging infrastructure, basically what we have to offer is a seamless private or private charging experience to address cons consumer uh, concerns. So uh, what we have to do is get as much consumers as we can. So we can see in the consumer demand side in this slide that there is a interrogation sign that correspond to the uncertainty that we are facing now because it is still unclear how many people will switch to electronic vehicles. How can we how can we attract that kind of people? And one of the issues is through well uh, infrastructure. Uh, there are some concerns about the autonomy of the, of the electric vehicle. How, how long can I go through the road with just one charging? Yeah? And there are concerns that says that for short travels, it is okay. But when we have to face long range travel, people are really, really skeptical about the autonomy of the vehicle. But this is not the issue. In a survey made in, in Germany, 74% of the people answer that during long journeys, they take a rest every four or five hours to eat something, to drink, or just to stand up. So what we need is the infrastructure, the, char the rapid charge infrastructure to charge the vehicles as long as the consumers are doing something else, like traveling or taking a rest when they are in a long journey. So we have three big groups for recharging infrastructure. The private zone that basically is your home. 
So you have to, you have, to have the infrastructure in order that you can connect, that you can plug your vehicle, and the next day you will go out without any problem. The second one is the private zones with public access. Let's say, for example, the hotels. Yeah? You go on a vacation, you, you want to take a rest, and the hotel must provide to you the service of charging your vehicle. Also, we can say, for example, the cinemas, as long as you watch the movie or the restaurants, and the public zones that basically are what you see every day on the streets, the gas stations. But we need to adapt then for uh, the new trend of electronic vehicles. So in this map, this is the map of Bogota, Colombia. Uh, this a small, this district that you can see in the map are some, in somehow, if I, I want to make the comparison with Seoul, is one of the Ku, Kwanak, Ku, Mapo, Gu, Kanangu, and you can see the infrastructure for charging that right now, in this moment, we have only 35 points for rapid charging. By 2030, Bogota is committed to have 600,000 EVs. But the forecast says that we will only achieve 190,000 vehicles. So if we don't improve this infrastructure, it would be really difficult to attract more consumers, more drivers, more people that want to make the big step and switch to electronic vehicles. So for finalizing this, there is one big point is that we have everything to do. Yeah? We need to build the infrastructure needed to make the smoothless transition. And everything is going to happen. We have everything to do. The future could look some in somehow difficult, but the issue is that sooner or later, the majority of the cars on the street would be electric. So it's something that we don't have the choice, take it or not. No, you have to take it. We have to take it. So I just invite all of you to take this approach in your mind for, for the near future. So it's something that we have to do it sooner or later. To conclude our presentation, I will invite again Ethan. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, due to the time already that has already elapsed, I think we have to conclude our presentation here. But before we closing this session, we would like to thank two professors who led this team to reach to these outcomes. Professor Jun Seok Hwang, leading Smart City. Professor Hyun Yoon, who led the technology convergence as well. Please give them a big round of applause. And our journey to find out that these um, breakthrough ideas to create momentum of actions to reach to 2050 with carbon neutrality to prevent the increasing temperature of the whole world. So we will keep on the journey. We would like to find out other hermits, scholars, researchers, and friends on the way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.